Hi, welcome to the International Luxury Hotel Association. Uh, today's webinar, we're going to look at the 360 overview of hotel finance in Europe. Uh, I'm Alex Sonio, I lead the, the association for the whole uh, Europe. And today, um, I would like to present to you two. We have uh, Jeremy Jones, uh, we have Alistair, and we have Alex and Gustav, and I will let them uh, present themselves straight away. Thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Jeremy Jones. I'm head of the hotels brokerage team at Christie & Co. Uh, I'm in my 25th year of transacting on hotels across the UK and broadly into Europe. Uh, I'm Alistair Hockley. Um, I'm a, a chartered surveyor and specialist hotel valuer, um, also with Christie & Co, where I've been for 10 years. Um, I provide hotel valuations in the UK and across Europe, uh, generally with a focus on, on larger assets and, and portfolios. Um, and I typically work for banks, lenders, but also investors, owners, hotel brands and uh, asset managers. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Laws. Um, in the last 15 years, I've been an asset manager helping hotel owners, hotel companies, and people that actually work in hotels to maximize um, on the opportunity that the hotel gives. All right, and uh, Gustav? Hi, Gustav Bjorn. I am a uh, director with uh, Pan-European Investment Bank, Catella. Uh, specifically in, the, uh, in hospitality capital markets. Um, we focus on, my platform, fo platform focuses on uh, debt and um, equity plays as well. So capital advisory. All right, thank you very much. Well, I'm Alex Sonio. Again, uh, I'm also a hotel asset manager. Uh, stores. Um, we uh, we have about 50 hotels in Europe. Uh, it's an um, independent asset management company that was created about 15 years ago. And we have hotels across uh, Europe, Middle East, and, and Asia. So let's start uh, with, um, with a couple of questions uh, to Jeremy and Alex here. Um, so the lenders' uh, reaction to COVID in Europe was actually quite good. Um, the lenders stayed on the owner side. Uh, we saw it in most markets. And right now we, we're seeing limited distress assets. Um, is it, are we delaying a big wave um, of distress assets? Uh, is, do we have any differences between uh, different countries, north, south? Uh, what, what's the situation, Jeremy? Well, our experience, Alex, to date has been that, as you say, the lenders have been working with the bank's customers in a really constructive fashion, that either distributing the state aid, which has been made available, or extending the facilities they've got with the bank's customers, they have been very, very busy doing all they can in a really constructive fashion with the hotel owners, investors, landlords, developers across, across the whole of Europe. And as a consequence, that has really limited the element of distress assets coming to the market across Europe uh, because there is no imperative uh, at the moment. Uh, however, that looks like a road which isn't going to run forever. And we are starting to see uh, some of those lenders questioning some of their owners in respect of the large capital requirements which the owners require to reopen, relaunch their properties to the, to the trading market. In the UK, from the 17th of May onwards, hotels, hospitality businesses can operate fully inside, outside, no limitations whatsoever. Many, many businesses need financial assistance to reopen fully. And this is perhaps where some of the lenders will take a decision of either assisting further or stepping back a little and asking those hoteliers to find alternative uh, capital sources or inject more money into the businesses themselves. Yeah. 
I think I think if I can add to that, Jeremy, I think <clears throat> what you say is right. There's been there's been large government support um, towards the operations, which has been really helpful. But obviously, it's not something that can go on indefinitely. Um, and that's been like here in the UK, like you say, up to up to eighty percent of the salaries have been taken care of. That will not go on forever. And I think something we need to consider, and um, which may come back um, later on in the conversation, is how the market is going to adapt. Because once the hotels reopen, there is going to be a higher cost factor because of COVID and what can be done. Um, on the one side, it's an interesting point because on the one side, there will be a significant amount of pent up demand when it comes from leisure travel. But I think at the same time, we should be wary of what's going to happen from a corporate travel perspective. And it really, and that then links to what you said, Alex, what geographic location you are in is going to be really important. I think uh, the summer is going to be um, very good for a lot of hotels, just like it was in 2020. But we really have to wait and see what's going to happen from a corporate business perspective, both um, on a room side, but also on an event side. So from what I hear, I mean, I agree with you, Alex. Uh, I mean, lots. I heard from operators that um, business travel will decrease by 20 to 40 percent. People are used to um, those, uh, those online platforms now. Um, this, uh, this is going to have a major impact on major cities like London and Paris, for sure. And now this training, I mean, this uncertainty is a problem. Where, where Alistair, maybe it's for you and Alex, you can also respond, is where do the values uh, lie uh, today? As an appraiser, what do you think, uh, Alistair? Um, it, it's a uniquely difficult market in which to benchmark values at, at the moment um, when compared to pre-pandemic. Um, there have been far fewer hotel transactions in the last year across Europe, uh, something like a 70% reduction in the volume of overall deals, um, I believe. Um, hotels have generally been closed through this period um, with um, differing lengths of time. Um, and recovery profiles across different types of assets are likely to be very different. Um, and that uncertainty is not limited to the hotels themselves. There is a wider concern around the, the speed of recovery internationally. Um, so in aggregate, um, unfortunately, values have probably fallen across, across the hotel market due to reduced cash flows in the hotel businesses and less accessibility of traditional financing through this this period uh, and of course the, the increased uncertainty but that's not a uniform coverall view there are some winners and losers in in, in asset types um, we see that the, um, the better assets the most successful assets in the in the current market have been those that have a focus as Alex indicated on, on, on domestic leisure um, the extended stay market is interesting at the moment because they tend to have their own kitchenette facilities and social distancing and the like has been easier in that type of product. Same with service departments and assets that lie in uh, drive to locations, be them in the same country or in, a, in another country that can be easily accessed without the need to fly or, or, or travel long distances. Um, less um, or, or bigger drops in value, I suppose, we might have seen in, in assets that are focused more on the corporate sector uh, city centres, um, conference hotels, events hotels that, that have more of a focus on, on that kind of group gathering that we've seen less of in the last period of time. Um, airport hotels fall into that, that camp as well with reduced international travel at present. Um, and markets with a greater reliance on, on international travel are probably those where we've seen the, the, the biggest fall in values. Um, so there's a wide range um, and, and we're taking the approach of looking at each individual asset and their recovery profile quite specifically to each asset. And then Alex, in your hotels, um, do you see major changes uh, in hotel values? And, and, uh... and I see a significant amount of caution coming from the valuers. <laughs> um, but I, I, 
I think there is there is a balance that can be reached there, and I think um, what you can do is is you can look at it from from different perspective. Instead of doing one valuation, you you can perhaps pl- apply one or two more what if scenarios. To use a cliche, we're in unprecedented times. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but everyone is trying to do their best to to, maintain our industry and to make sure that it's as successful as possible for all parties involved. But I think at the same time, as Alistair said, there are some some issues that, that will be difficult and that will affect the valuation. At the same time, I think as we learn how to live and how to work in a different fashion, I think things will come back. And I think we, we if you talk about the bigger markets in Europe, if you talk about, you, you mentioned London, you mentioned Paris, there is a significant amount of resilience that will ultimately, I think, come back, particularly on the leisure aspect. What I've seen in, in, in um some of the other hotels is that people are starting to become creative when it comes to meetings and events. Um, I have seen hotels doing half half where they split meeting rooms um, and half of it is now screens where we can do a zoom conference like we do today. And the other half is socially distanced people meeting. Um, I think as a race, we are, we need social interaction and I have a feeling that it will come back. Will it ever be the way it was? Possibly not. But ultimately, I think things will return to the levels that we used to, and that will certainly apply to valuations as well. Okay, thank you. So I look at you, Gustav, while while uh, Alistair and Alex were, were talking, and I was you you look very worried. Um, well, <laughs> what, 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 what's, what's the value of evaluation for you as a as a lender today? Well, I mean, it's. Um, um, you know, obviously, um, the information and especially the market benchmarks and the market outlook that the appraisal appraisers and others that they have, you know, is, you know, providing the backbone, but obviously there's a lot of pushback because, you know, there's substantially more risk in the market than, than, than there has been, uh, so, uh, well, not pushback, but maybe more of a uh, sort of an <laughs> intense conversation around what is the value of an asset, um, because some of the some of the loans being applied today, because there are still institutions lending to the industry, also in a development capacity, is you know they're providing loans which in effect can maintain themselves over a period of time. So there are some, you know, there are operating guarantees or, uh, or, or reserves in an escrow or and um, interest payment reserves or guarantees. Um, and they want to make sure that, you know, for the purpose of their refinancing that the value here is correct. But obviously, you know, it's in everybody's interest, uh, also the banks, that there is liquidity in the market also these days. And, you know, obviously an appraiser is an appraiser and what he says is you know, usually a, you know, a solid piece of work. But that, that's my point. Is it like, what do you expect from appraisers and, and even asset managers in this event? Well, to, to, to dilute risk, to, to be that sort of, um, you know, you know, from an asset management point of view to, you know, be that sort of independent same voice that makes sure that, that, um, that interests are aligned and the profits are protected. And, you know, because there are so many, um, uh, you know, um, different opinions and, you know, different interests in a deal. So having an asset manager in there to sort of, you know, weigh things up and be the, the missing link is, is extremely valuable from risk perspective. And also, you know, in the sense of working with the appraiser to the extent it's possible. Uh, because 
many times there are shutters in between those processes. Um, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's enormously helpful because it provides that picture that the lenders, they typically don't have themselves. Obviously they do deals and they get their own research, but it creates, you know, just a clearer picture. Yeah, that's why actually for this panel in particular, I wanted to have like a mix of lenders, asset managers, and uh, brokers and appraisers. So we can all give our opinion. And it's good to see the interaction as a lender, how you position yourself and what you expect from, uh, from, from the rest of us. So uh, come back, let's come back to Jeremy here. Um, Funding today <laughs> um, is, is very challenging, no doubt. Um, we tend to go towards more alternative lenders, right? Uh, I see this more and more. Um, and it's, it's becoming basically more attractive than, than traditional uh, lenders. Uh, what's the situation on your side? What do you think about this? Alex, like yourself, we are seeing more and more lending from a variety of alternative um, opportunistic funds. And recent cases we've seen of these are quite interesting because uh, in the main, these are North American funds who across the whole gamut of their business are also hotel hospitality business owners. Now they're lenders into the hotel and hospitality space. And that really helps with the underwriting from their point of view, as Gustav has just said, uh, as, as much underwriting, solid diligence, many of these funds are coming into situations with highly competent operators who on a no fault basis have found themselves with a lender, an incumbent lender who essentially has said no more. So they've been, they're in a corner where they're looking for uh, as inexpensive debt as possible, albeit more expensive than the debt they've been used to in recent years, but they're looking for a source of debt and we are seeing these alternative lenders filling that gap. And that could be to finance semi-finished new bill schemes. We've seen several in, in London where they've stepped in, where the bankers have gone to finance completion of substantial construction projects and then provide working capital for the period to fair maintainable, to establish trade. Uh, they're filling a real gap at the moment, Alex, and they can move very quickly. They're very entrepreneurial based organizations. Yes, the downside is the debt is more expensive, but they're providing a solution both for capital projects and critically working capital for the next 12 months, whatever that may be. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to this um, because it's very interesting the way it's, uh, it's changing and what the future holds. Um, but I want to, to, to ask maybe uh, Gustav and Jeremy, you know, this crisis has questioned the future of uh, grant rent structure. Uh, what, what's your opinion uh, on this? Gustav, you may wish to go first. Stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 they should really be um, last, last, last resort. People that look at these as, you know, I understand that they can be perceived as being um, a source of capital, uh, which structurally is sort of a hybrid between, you know, your cash flow and your capital um, in terms of maintaining you know the the this type of capital but um you have a couple of issues because hotel cash flow is volatile um and adding another fixed component that just keeps growing and growing and growing onto your pnl is not a helpful thing especially if you're looking to refinance at some point in time your senior debt because you know, it depends on the cycle, it depends on which point in the cycle you're in, your senior debt becomes more or less refinanceable because of this. During the financial crisis, you had, there were a huge problem for many of the people that had done this because their senior debt, they just couldn't get it refinanced anywhere because of these levered land uses. And then you obviously you have the peppercorns, which is a different issue. 
but uh, but 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 they really should be. People should look at if they go with land leases now, they should look at it as exiting their assets. Um, they're losing control. Maybe not today, but down the line they will. That's my opinion. Stay away. Playing the the broker's devil's advocate, uh, Alex. Um, what is the most liquid hotel investment? It's a freehold one. Absolutely. The greatest audience of buyers and the greatest uh, uh, competitive tension you can create in the sales process is for a freehold asset. Noted. Absolutely. However, the blunt instrument of the ground rent has finessed slightly in the last couple of years. And there has been more of a, 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 an a la carte um, capability to, to, to ground rent structures, which offer things such as buyback provision. So in other words, that, that the tenant, yes. As long as the commercial deals are right and it provides somebody with an opportunity to reunite the business with the property, then that can be helpful. But, but I do agree with Gustav, uh, you know, at the end of the day, many investors get into the hotel industry because they're attracted by the property participation and separating property from business. It does discount a big chunk of international buyers, particularly Far East and Middle East. Thank you. Um, Gustav, to come back on, uh, on this um, fund structure, uh, it's becoming more and more complicated, I have to admit. And um, as senior debt leverage decrease, do you think middle debt will bridge a gap? Um, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, obviously, it's a jungle out there trying to find out as a borrower, uh, and obviously they will need you know somebody like you know me or Jeremy to to, to guide them in there. Uh, but it is a jungle what the intentions are with the direct lending funds or shadow banks or, or you know these alternative sources of debt because some of them have a very clear intention to own your asset at some point. Uh, but some um, also have you know are looking genuinely to bridge gaps, uh, but also make some money in the process. But ultimately, their main uh, objective is not to own your asset, but it's to lend out money. Uh, so those people, uh, for sure, they will help bridge. But obviously, you know, bridges, they need to be, they can either lead to safer shores or they can lead into the, you know, open mouth of a big white shark. It's just a matter of, you know, these bridges, they need to be built with the right material long enough and strong enough. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, the cost of that um, is on the rise, right? Um, it's going to have major consequences. Um, are you seeing, for example, in one of my assets, uh, we, well, I try to convince the owner to have a, an operational reserve just in case we have another bump on the road um, and, and similar to the FFNE reserve. Just, just to be on the safe side, we never really used that. I don't know if Alex, you had the, uh, you had the case uh, on some, some of your assets. Well, well I think about the, the, in, the impact because as asset managers, um, often some asset managers just stop at GOP, but uh, we, I know you don't. And I don't. <laughs> um, so, what, what's how do you see this? How it's going to? I mean, our focus has been on this for for, for the past eighteen months. Um, what's the situation on your side? Uh, the, I, you know, you know me well enough to to split it. Any company that splits its P and L halfway and says that the upper half belongs to someone and the bottom half belongs to someone else, I think I think is is ridiculous. And our industry is ridiculous from that perspective. What you're touching on here um, is is the fact that we have to work together, and whether that's going to be through an operational reserve or not. 
um, at the end of the day, and there's one thing that we, we've missed in the conversation so far I'd like to bring in, and that's the operation as such. Because the operation as such could also be costly. And I think that all parties involved, including operators, should become more flexible and more nimble in the way that they work yeah, and adapt to the market. And if I'm really frank, I think that's what I've been missing. Um, I'm not going to name names here, but in some of the big operating companies I'm missing at the moment is that nimbleness and flexibility to the market and saying, like, this is where we are now. Now, how are we going to how are we going to approach this challenge together? Yeah. Now, that could be through an operational reserve. Yeah, where you, where you have, but then the question is, should that be restricted cash or not? Should it be a nominal? No, well, it won't be a nominal amount because you don't know if you can get your cash. But I think what is more important in this matter is that we actually look at our operations and look at what works at the moment and together try to look into the future and what will work. We, we spoke earlier about, about corporate travel, the way it's going to change. Um, my question out there is, has anyone really thought about the structure? Of course, we've all done all the COVID thing and the PB, PPE thing and all that sort of stuff. But have we structurally thought about the way we are going to do business post-COVID? I, I, I saw five RFPs <laughs> coming through my desk this week. That's something we've done for 15 years, and I argue that that has been outdated for a long time. But at the same time, the hotels rely on that for the corporate travel, so they have to go through it, yeah? costing money. Can we work together in a flexible way to drive that operation? Because ultimately, if we drive the operation, we drive the valuation, we drive the ownership, and, and, and we drive the fees that the management companies make. And you know, here you're saying like basically asset management is really needed and, and proactively yeah. the operate the operation, right? Yeah, but I think uh, yeah, okay, that's the core of asset management. Yes, but I think we're also in uncharted territory where we have to start working together and being creative. And for for any party to keep their foot down and say, well, this is a brand standard, this is what we got to do, is impacting the hotel as such. Mm -hmm. And I think. I think there is more opportunities to work to work together in order to to try and achieve that, and an operational reserve could be part of that, which in in, in that particular case will work in you know, a benefit from an operating company, but I think then something needs to be given back for that that we say okay, what can we do from an owner's perspective from from a lender's perspective where we say this will really benefit and drive the hotel. It's going to be tough. It's going to be, and when the furlough and stuff falls away, it's going to be really, really tough. And while well, we arrive at the, at the at the bottom of the PNL here, um, so I'm going to speak with the DCF guy, Alistair. What <laughs> what's the uh, what's uh, what the cost of debt and how how it's going to impact uh, on valuation? Uh, the cost of debt itself. Yeah. Um, I think from a, from a valuation perspective, um, we're, we're assuming a sale. So we're not looking at the, the express debt that any asset may particularly have, but it's a, it's a function of the um, activity in the market in terms of what the cost of debt is. So the higher the cost of debt, um, the, the, the less uh, likely transactions are to to move with um, with the, with a sort of speed and quantity that, that they might do if if debt was cheaper. Uh, so we see fewer transactions and uh, and values are likely to be held back a little bit by that. The absolute cost of debt itself doesn't have a you know an right, right. impact on the on the valuation as such in in much the same way as holding an operational reserve wouldn't either because that's a um, a cash holding that the individual owns, albeit I think arguably quite a sensible idea to have a reserve to uh, to see you through a rainy day. And what's about um, the impact of uh, of an asset manager? I mean, we we I saw some hotels um, that were dry bone, I call it uh, asset managed, with uh, really little cost to uh, to shave up. Um, 
do you see this as an impact on, on valuation um, when, when the owner in, engaged in asset manager? On, on, on the asset? Absolutely. Um, and there are two ways that values can be improved. Uh, you're either looking to improve your uh, EBITDA performance over time, uh, your bottom line, or there's a shift in the yield you might apply to a property, uh, which is demand driven and market driven. Um, we see, I think, that asset managers often can um, streamline and, as Alex said, be more nimble in the way they operate properties um, with, with wider and you know, European-wide contacts and ability to, to operate in a manner that is um, more efficient often than an independent operator or, or even a brand operator where whose interest isn't quite as aligned with an individual property as an asset manager can. Um, and it's often a very good way to um, improve our expectations of performance over time, which arguably, yes, can have a positive impact on, on, on valuations if, if that's demonstrated. Uh, the, the one caveat to that is you just have to balance that improved performance against, uh, against fees, of course. Yeah, what I'm seeing is uh, with my hotels is um, lots of operators, um, especially on a corporate level, uh, laid off. Uh, the teams, the corporate team, and we hotels get less and less support um, uh, from from corporation, um, and I don't see this trend come come back straight away. Um, so really, the the recovery needs to come from the owner or the asset manager, and it's I mean it's need to be orchestrated by them. Um, now, Gustav, as a, you know, as a lender, do you also I return this question to you is. Uh, do you think that asset management is really important? Which type of asset management? Do you want an asset management from a, a big brand consulting company, independent companies, or just an owner rep? Or do, you, do you ask your owners to have asset managers? What's the situation here? Um, well, fundamentally, it's a, um, it's a really good question, and it's a very relevant one. Um, and, you know, I think that asset management has been essential, should be essential. And it's an old conversation, but it should be essential to, uh, to the industry. And it, you know, that has been the case for the last 30 years, ever since the big companies started you know, to either spin off uh, or sell off their assets um, into weeks or, or far to the market because it bridges a, a knowledge gap an insight and a market gap from the property, the management, which, you know, in many, you know, many, many instances, or there are a lot of conflicts of interest there, right? To the owner, which in many instances right now, some of the biggest hotel real estate owners are, you know, private equities that typically the way that they do things is that they sit with their big portfolios and obviously they do have some kind of management or, or asset management capabilities themselves, but the actual sort of knowledge gap and, but also time and effort to sort of hold the management company, keeping them honest, making sure that they're doing things which are in the interest of the owner and therefore also in the interest of the lender. Um, but, but, you know, so so very much, so very much. Now, well, at Catella, we're not we're not a bank as such. We're a, an investment bank, so you know we're capital market driven, but we do have a big involvement in that you know in that process. And you know, from our point of view in the hotel industry, it should be yeah, not because I know you well, Alex, but that's my my honest opinion. It should be essential because it, it dilutes risk and it helps build a knowledge bridge which again dilutes risk. Yeah. yeah, if the lender is saying yes and the appraisers are, are saying yes as well, that's, that's good. We have a good future together with, uh, with Alex Toss. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, now, Jeremy and Alistair, maybe the final question would be for you and, uh, and for you both. What are the future trends um, coming up? I mean, are we expecting lots of tra transactions um, distress asset, not distress asset. Um, are we going to see lots of, obviously, lots of refinancing? 
uh, I would imagine. What's 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 your take? Well, one trend I've noticed, Alex, the, these last couple of weeks is the number of new opportunity-led hospitality funds which have been created. In the last week, I, I can probably count three. And if you aggregate the funds, the firepower that they want to put into the sector, it's probably about 2 billion euros. And these new uh, fund managers creating the funds are walking away from big roles in the industry or big roles with well-established funds. So something tells me they can see something over the hill, which are Q4, Q1, 22. I think they can see an escalation of supply of big asset opportunities, portfolios, restructurings, non-performing loans, that those opportunities will come to market. But is it one and, question, is it short term or you, you expect like a, the window for me, I believe that it's going to be a very short window of opportunity, like uh, half a year where we're going to have good deals, good potential. What do you, do you have this impression? Well, yes, I probably do agree with you, Alex, that this is not going to be some elongated a global financial crash um, where there was in some territories inaction from the lenders to move the problem on. I think you're right. It will, it will be relatively short and sharp. Um, businesses now, trading businesses are keen to start. They're keen to start their cash flow. Absolutely. But the legacy issues to be confronted, which is in the UK non-payment of rent, this last 14 or 15 months, running into billions. Uh, the ability of landlords in some months to take back possession. There will be a flurry of activity, but I don't anticipate this thing will be running the five or six years it took 2008 onwards. I don't anticipate that sort of timing. Alistair, what do you think? Well, I'd agree with you, Jeremy. I think we're uh, likely to see some of these assets which have probably struggling a little bit at the moment come to market at some point once once the certainty is there around uh, operational activity when things are able to be reopened again and government support drops away I think it'll it'll become clear quite quickly um, what, what's viable and what's not and, and and that sort of gap that we're seeing at the moment between bid and ask prices will, will, will narrow and, and the transactions will occur. But as Jeremy says, I think this will be a, it'll be quite clear cut as to which those assets are and, and that opportunity will be there. And we know the capital is in place waiting to, to jump on that opportunity at, at present. So uh, now I think we're, we're all going to be quite busy coming up soon. Um, probably just about the same time that we're allowed to go on holiday again. So uh, it, it's going to be some interesting times ahead. Um, not all straightforward, but but equally, I think it's a, you know it remains an exciting and interesting time to uh, to, to be in this sector. Thank you, Alistair. I think we cover all the points. But do you have anything else to add, anyone? I would yes. just say. Oh, sorry, Alex. I, I no, no, you go first. The, the way that hotels operate uh, probably needed to change, will change. Uh, let's see how long the learnings last. Mm. Um, you know, how one runs a hotel, what one can expect from the brands, what you should expect from your, your asset manager. And I see definitely uh, the banks, when they come out of this, to the whole asset manager role, and as Gustav said, this has been an argument forever. You know, there should be covenants within loans that say hotels should have FF and E reserve, reserves, asset managers in place. I think all that is up for grabs. Yeah. It would be fantastic. It was coming from the members, I think, this, uh, this kind of initiative. Uh, Alex, would, would you want to add something? Well, I think that was a perfect intro by Jeremy. Um, I, I think it's. The market conditions are going to change. 
And I think we all need to adapt to that very, very, very quickly. And what, what Alistair said before is that I think it's right as well. It's good, or, or it was Jeremy, but it's going to be a short, sharp shock to the system in which we need to adapt change the market conditions and then make sure that we get it right you also have to consider is that like things like distribution loyalty are going to change significantly because of what we are allowed and what we won't be allowed to do and what for what we're willing and not willing to do and i think those those apply both for the leisure as well as for the corporate sector so market conditions will change we need to adapt quick and let's let's not forget it's all about the hotel yeah without hotels there'd be none of us and <laughs> none of us would have something to say for that so we need to all parties involved need to put themselves behind the hotels and behind the industry and start driving it forward and bringing it back and we can alex i was going to do a, a conclusion but was that? sorry <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, webinar. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you soon. And we'll see you again on another webinar next month. Thank you, everyone.